Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webcast of Deloitte. At our customer's request, this conference will be recorded. During the presentation, you have the opportunity to ask questions via the text box in your webcast window. Your questions will be answered at the end of the conference. Now we start the webcast. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webcast about German-Russian transfer pricing regulations and issues. Before we actually start with the presentation, some remarks about organization. As already said, this webcast is being recorded and you get access to this record by this week. The access um, will last for the next three months. And if you have questions, please send them via that chat function and we will answer them at the very end of this webcast. If there wouldn't be no sufficient time left to answer all of the questions, we will answer them individually by email. Who we are is now shown on the next slide. So I would like with myself, would start um, with myself to introduce myself. I'm a certified tax advisor in Germany and a transfer pricing director dealing with transfer pricing issues for more than 10 years. I'm supported by Anna, not just by, for this webcast, but also on a daily basis. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Anna Radivojevic. I am a um, transfer pricing manager at Deloitte Germany. Um, I have a lot of experience with transfer pricing in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, given that I'm also coming from this region. And um, one of my roles in Deloitte Germany is um, generally to uh, work closely and coordinate with our colleagues from um, CE region. And um, today we have here with us our colleagues from um, Deloitte Russia, uh, Yulia Simitnia and uh, Alexei Sotchuk. So I will let them introduce themselves. Uh, hello, my name is Yulia Senitsina. I'm a director in Transfer Pricing Group at Deloitte Moscow. I'm working with Deloitte for 13 years, and my areas of focus are consumer business clients and intellectual property transactions. Hello, everybody. My name is Alexey Savchuk. I am also a director in Moscow office. Uh, I am dealing with transfer pricing issues starting from 2007, well, uh, well before uh, the actual transfer pricing law was uh, introduced in Russia. So, also has quite an experience in this field. Handing over back to Stephanie. Yes, thank you, Alexi. So we come now to the content of our today's webcast. So we um, found some hot topics such as tax audit procedures and um, best action points. So um, Russia is not part of the OECD but of the G20 and uses the OECD model tax treaty for um, its double tax treaties as such also with Germany. And we will touch on the topics of um, PE issues of royalty payments, documentation requirements, year-end um, adjustments and customs. And as already mentioned, we'd like to share with you our tax audit experiences. But before we start with these um, transfer pricing specific topics, we like to give you a broad overview on the economic relationship between Germany and Russia. Uh, so um, basically, um, as a short introduction on, on how, how we got to, to um, this idea of having this webcast and, and why uh, we see this as important, um, basically, um, you have all witnessed a lot of changes in the uh, transfer pricing regulatory re requirement recently, and, and, and multi multinational companies um, have, have uh, a lot of work and a lot of effort is, is required in order to be compliant with all, all of this um, legislation and to ensure um, um, that uh, approach is coordinated within different countries while still um, local requirements are, are taking, taken into account. Um, Russia is no exception to this, um, and also uh, with regard to, to growing uh, significance of transfer pricing topics. Uh, 
Um, additional um, uh, factor that, that definitely uh, impacts the business of multinational companies in Russia is generally um, political situation and, and the sanctions and the effect that they have on, on um, general uh, business envi environment. Um, as you can see from, from our slide, um, this um, situation has um, led to um, somewhat uh, reduced level of um, economic relations between Russia and, and uh, Germany in respect of uh, reduced import and export from Russia and also uh, with regard to reduced direct investments. Um, on the other hand, um, this also for some companies that, that also just meant that um, uh, access to, to the Russian market and business with, with Russia um, needed a certain restructuring in order to be um, able to, to continue. Um, and transfer pricing um, is uh, for sure um, one of very significant topics that need to be considered when taking all of this into account. Um, now I am going to um, give word to um, our colleagues from Deloitte Russia who will give us a bit more details on the current business climate, climate in Russia. Uh, thank you. Today, with the oil prices recovery and decreasing national currency volatility, the Russian economy is becoming more stable, and we can finally see light at the end of the tunnel. Investors have become more active, while Russian capital still dominates in transaction volumes, and the share of foreign investors remains low. Among foreign investors, there are a growing number of projects from Asian companies. For Western investors, political factors remain an obstacle. Potentially, we see a rise of debt financing deals, which are attractive against low interest rates in developed countries. Looking ahead, some experts expect that the Russian economy to return to positive growth in 2017, and the project at GDP expansion of around 1.2% year-to-year for 2017 as a whole. Nonetheless, private consumption will remain weak, as consumers remain reluctant to spend, given that household finances were battered during the recession by the ruble devaluation and spike of inflation, while interest rates remain high. Moreover, the Russian payday loan industry has thrived during the economic downturn, leaving many households saddled with very high levels of debt. Ongoing fiscal consolidation will also weigh on overall growth. While the economy remains fragile amid heightened global uncertainty, the low for longer oil price environment and ongoing Western imposed sanctions. And now I'm handing over to Stephanie, who will discuss uh, the EPE situation in Germany, and then we'll continue by Russian implications. Um, so our first topic uh, today is um, that's action point number seven and permanent establishment. Um, so, as, as you are um, all, uh, I'm sure, aware, uh, the main aim of uh, uh, action point number seven is uh, to prevent uh, artificial avoidance of permanent establishment um, uh, status. Uh, which um, and, and um, which, which was done through um, commissioner and um, other structures. Um, and uh, while previously uh, the, the definition um, of the permanent establishment was, was focused on, on having the <coughs> um, fixed uh, business, uh, fixed place of business, um, through, uh, fixed place of, of activity through which business is. Um, uh, performed uh, with certain um, uh, exemptions, uh, for example, for uh, preparatory and auxiliary activities. Um, the experience has shown that these preparatory and auxiliary activities uh, basically can um, constitute uh, the business in itself. Um, this especially in, in case that the tendency was to, uh, to, of multinational companies to, to segment uh, the, the activities into um, smaller, uh, let's say, uh, portions of, of contracts or portions of activities, which then can easily, more easily be uh, considered as, as preparatory or, or auxiliary. 
Um, and uh, BEPS um, action number seven introduces um, a measure to, to um, um, kind of um, uh, prevent this and, and um, introduces uh, the anti-fragmentation rule, uh, which would make it, um, um, let's say, <laughs> impossible or, or, or very difficult to um, uh, avoid permanent establishment status uh, through uh, segmentation of, of, of activities in, into, let's say, smaller ones. Um, also, very um, significant uh, topics uh, covered by uh, BEPS action number seven, and uh, probably uh, one of the, the, the biggest issues, maybe for, for most multinational companies, are the dependent agent uh, uh, rules. So um, this is where we see um, uh, a really a big change. Uh, previously, we had uh, a, a permanent establishment. Um, it, it could be considered that no permanent establishment exists um, if uh, the representatives uh, provide um, support, um, even if this support is significant for, for concluding the contract. Um, as long as the principal um, uh, provides, uh, it, it actively involved and actively, let's say, reviews the, the uh, conditions that are that are provided by this contract. While under the, the new changes, um, this is much more strict, and um, the, the permanent establishment is due to exist. Um, as long as, uh, as, as uh, the, let's say, the, the dependent agent or the agent um, makes the essential uh, contribution towards concluding, concluding the contract, whether this is sharing price lists, um, uh, doing some initial negotiation or, or similar. Um, Generally, um, the, the, the um, tendency in Germany is basically to, um, uh, and the position of, of Germany is that um, Germany is prepared to, to implement uh, the, the action points of, uh, to, to point, implement the points covered by BEPS number seven, uh, with the exception of uh, dependent uh, agent rules. Um, now let's um, hear a little bit about how this is regulated in Russia. Based on Article 5 of the Double Tax Treaty between Germany and Russia, where the PE is considered to exist depends on whether there is a fixed place of business through which the business of an enterprise is wholly or partly carried on. This definition includes three elements. The first is the place of business, which covers any premises or installations used for carrying on the business, whether or not they are used exclusively for that purpose. The second is the place of business should be fixed. And the third, the activities must be carried out through the place of business on a regular basis. A fixed place of business through which the enterprise exercises solely an activity which has for the enterprise a preparatory or auxiliary character and is performed for the benefit of a head office is deemed not to be a PE. Russian tax law provides for the application of the direct method in order to determine the profits tax base of a permanent establishment. It means revenues less deductible attributable expenses. At the same time, the law provides that where no remuneration can be defined for the rendered services, it is possible to use the indirect method by applying notional 20% margin on all expenses related to the activities through PE in Russia, which would then be subject to profit tax. Effectively, this means a 4% tax rate on the incurred expenses. Russian transfer pricing rules introduced in 2012 directly envisage that taxable base of a PE should be determined taking into account functions performed by a PE, risks assumed, and assets employed. In practice, this means that PE is established in the form of branches of foreign companies should ensure that their profit corresponds to the market level, although there is no direct obligation to prepare a TP documentation in Russia. For, for these permanent establishments. Up until now, the PE concept outlined in Russian domestic legislation has not changed. We have not heard about the intention to adjust it in the nearest future either. However, we recommend constantly monitoring the development of court practice, since we cannot exclude that BEPS concepts are not applied by the Russian tax authorities in practice. Now we will switch to in 
to the topic of in, uh, transactions with intangibles, and we will start with the Russian uh, our outline of the Russian situation, and then we will switch to the German peculiarities. So. In Russia, the tax authorities have always placed a special focus on intergroup transactions involving intangibles. However, with the initiation of the deauthorization project of the Russian economy, tax officials have embraced an even more aggressive policy towards cross-border transactions involving intangible assets between related parties. This statement is supported by case law, which demonstrates the development of a negative trend for taxpayers. Based on the research performed by our analytics group, top five intangibles that are used by Russian marketplace are trademarks, websites, software programs, patents, and know-how. Most of companies receive the rights to use IP objects from foreign IP owners. Only few are involved into the activities related to creation of intangibles. The most widespread mechanism of setting royalty rate is percent from revenues, sometimes combined with lump sum payment. Currently, residual royalty are not that popular. Overall, transactions with IP objects remain being a focus area for the Russian tax authorities, therefore should be properly structured in advance of implementation. Uh, the Russian civil code provides for the explicit list of uh, IP objects which are protected by Russian law and can be the subject of license agreements. There are 17 of them, and inter alia they include work of science, literature and art, computer programs, databases, audio records, inventions, and other objects. It is always recommended to ensure that intangible assets the rights on which are going to be uh, transferred by a foreign IP owner to a Russian company fall under the above definitions before entering into the relevant agreement. It might be the case that some of intangibles cannot be subject of a license agreement in Russia, hence relevant expenses may not be deducted for the Russian uh, profit tax purposes. At Deloitte Moscow office, we have a dedicated team of IP professionals with unique expertise on the market that includes legal tax, ERS, and IT people who assist clients with tailored IP solutions. As for the transfer pricing approach uh, to the transactions with intangibles, Russian TP law stipulates five transfer pricing methods that might be used for the analysis of control transactions, which are generally in line with OECD TP guidelines. However, Russian TP law provides for the strict hierarchy of the five methods. Primary method is, uh, is controlled and uh, is, uh, is CAP. The resale price method has the priority over CAP method in the transaction of uh, purchase and resale of goods without any rework. The second method is cost plus. The third method is cost plus, and it is applied to the transactions to provision, related to the provision of services, rendering of works, and also sale of goods. TNMM, or comparable profitability method, can be also considered as applicable TP method for the analysis of uh, various control transactions. In compliance with the hierarchy of TP methods prescribed by the Russian TP law, profit split has the lowest priority and could be applied to the analysis of prices set in the control transactions between the parties if it's no possibility to apply other transfer pricing methods. To the best of our knowledge, up until now, none of the transactions involving IP object has been reviewed uh, during a TP audit. Therefore, it is not easy to predict which particular approach the Russian tax authorities might prefer to pursue with respect to the control transactions with intangibles. In our practice, we tend to apply CAP supported by TNMM to confirm the arm's length level of prices set by the parties. Profit split is still rarely applied. For the transaction involving transfer of ownership on IP objects, we have used the opportunity to provided by the Russian tax code to apply other methods and supported the value of transaction using evaluation methods. Now I'm passing the word to my German colleagues with respect to IP uh, transaction, uh, transactions in Germany. Thank you, Julia. So we have a closer look on royalties and the bets action uh, number 8 to 10 here in Germany. So actually we have not really in hierarchy in our method, but for sure you should decide for a suitable method which fits to the transaction on hand. And so we also apply quite often the CAP method in form of a license benchmarking study when it comes to IP evaluation or to find the right transfer price, royalty um, um, price in, in um, IP transactions. 
So, um, however, just one approach is also in Germany not really promising to convince our tax auditors, and thus we often evaluate the benefit arising from the IP or royalty payment in order to substantiate the value of the IP. So royalties appears especially when an exit taxation resulting from a so-called transfer of function should be avoided, uh, what we can see um, on our next page. The transfer of function is really a very special topic, very special for Germany. Um, nowhere else in the world I saw something like that before. Um, it is maybe for the reason that Germans are very proud of their IP and in the past that um, it was handled quite often the way that IP was um, research developed here in Germany under huge costs and the costs uh, stick here with the German um, uh, taxpayer while the IP as such was then later on exploited elsewhere in the world and um, that's most often or very often in jurisdictions with a lower um, tax rate. Um, tax authorities um, got aware of that issue and in 2008 they implemented a new law. Um, so the new law is saying when you transfer a function and um, function is defined as anything like a department or a business line, but it always has to be combined with some sort of IP. Then this triggers an exit taxation, which is valued also in a very special manner. We call it transfer package valuation, and we have also a slide for this um, um, as, as the next slide. But before we come to that, um, I want to say um, that um, the license payment can avoid such a one-off exit payment, and that's why um, German tax um, payers are quite often um, like to introduce some sort of a license regime or a royalty regime when it comes to IP. So imagine you have developed here some sort of IP, you have some IP, and then this function together with IP is shifted, and if it's just the customer base and some other IP, uh, you shift then the, the department or with, with team um, abroad and it um, continues working somewhere else, um, then you have um, uh, basically two chances. The first is that you conduct such a um, transfer package valuation and the value is then taxed as a one-time payment, as an exit taxation by normal tax rate here in Germany, or you license that IP or moreover the function, you license it out. And then the license needs to be based on the turnover or actual sales. So that's very important that it's based on actual numbers and not as on some sort of uh, predictions and expectation uh, coming from your um, valuation, which you have to do when you go for a one-off payment. I show you now that transfer package valuation on this slide. Um, so the expectation on an IP needs to be evaluated upfront. And um, we all know from the BEPS initiative 8 to 10, action point N to 10, that hard to value intangibles gives reasons to scrutinize the valuation assumptions. This could even lead to adjustments up to five years after the transfer of this function in an OECD perspective. And in a German perspective, this ends after 10 years if you do nothing. So after 10 years, the tax auditor can adjust the price based on the actual, actual development of your IP, of your revenue, of your gains you actually received from this function. So you can avoid that easily in writing down in your transfer agreement. Um, we want to apply a kind of a true up mechanism after a couple of years, whatever is arm's length, whatever you can defend. So we saw many times two or three years. The two or three years are much better to handle than a 10 years time frame. 
And so there is not such an inherent risk anymore in each of these IP-related transactions, or moreover, you can better evaluate and handle the risk, so two or three years are better to handle than up to 10 years. And um, on, on the slide you can see now um, in, in front of you, there is mentioned a very special valuation procedure necessary to satisfy the German law when it comes to a transfer of a function. So the procedure assumes full transparency and considers both perspectives, the seller perspective and the purchaser perspective. The transfer price is then conducted to take the middle value of the lowest seller price and the highest purchaser price. But as said, things can change, especially when it's about IP, and thus the taxpayer should make sure that, um, as I said before, the transfer agreement comes up with some sort of a true up clause um, that applies earlier than 10 years, um, 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 uh, yeah, reconciliation, how the IP developed over the time frame, and then make himself automatically an adjustment based on the true up clause as written in the transfer agreement. And then he can handle the risk much easier. I give you now an outlook of um, another issue coming up here in Germany um, planned for the next year, for the year 2018. So this is now um, the other way, the opposite case. We are paying here um, um, royalties, license fees, maybe um, to Russia. And up from next year, our government is saying um, these license payments are not necessarily fully deductible anymore. So we still have some limits, limitations on the deductibility of license payments in our trade tax law. So income tax in Germany is twofolded. We have an income tax for corporations, and we have in addition, besides the CIT, also trade tax law. In trade tax law, as said, there is um, since years the case that you cannot um, fully deduct a license payment. Now, means next year, that should also be the way for corporate income tax purposes. So up from next year, let's make an, make an example. We pay some um, license fee for technology to um, Russia. And we know that Russia has a statutory tax rate of 20%. And let's assume that is also the effective tax rate in this year, that 20%, that would, would follow or would result in a tax deductibility um, of 20%, so limitation of 20% of the license payment, which are then not um, deductible, tax deductible here in Germany. And um, when, when you see that in um, relation to other um, countries um, with a nexus approach, the so countries which have a preferred regime, um, which is um, uh, in conform with the OECD nexus approach, then this might um, be fully deductible, but please be aware of that for brands and trademarks that cannot be applied at all. So for trades and, and, and trademarks, you never have the chance to fully deduct your license and royalty payments um, when the other jurisdiction has an effective tax rate of less than 25%. And please be also aware of when the recipient is just a pass-through entity, so means they um, collect the license payment, but they forward them to another jurisdiction, then based on our new transparency um, requirements, what Anna will now um, uh, share with you in, in more detail, um, we'll get to know that, that this entity is just a pass-through entity, and um, then they look to the final recipient and that jurisdiction if there the royalty payments are taxed with 10, 25% or less and will make their judgment on this final recipient country. 
So, Anna, please explain a bit more to us about BEPS number 13 and the documentation requirement which came up or comes up right now. So, um, as you are all um, probably aware of, um, OECD um, has um, come up with, uh, uh, with, with uh, BEPS Action Point 13, which envisages um, a three-tier documentation uh, a requirement for, for, for multinational companies, uh, which consists of uh, master file, local file, and um, CBC template. So master file, which uh, contains information uh, about the, the uh, general organizational structure of multinational company, about uh, uh, the global uh, business operations and global strategies, intangibles, um, uh, intergroup financing and, and other um, uh, uh, matters that are relevant for the group as a whole. Um, on the other side, uh, there is a um, local file with the de detailed information on the local entity and focused more on, on tra transaction basis. Uh, and basically which cont uh, contains the economic analysis showing whether uh, the transactions are at length or not. And um, CBC um, template uh, or CBC report which contains um, information, specific prescribed information uh, over um, uh, the different tax jurisdictions in which um, uh, uh, the group is um, uh, doing business. Uh, which should um, uh, for sure uh, not, not serve for any kind of uh, transfer pricing assessment by the tax authorities, uh, but uh, should um, and, and probably will serve as some kind of initial uh, risk assessment from, from their side. Um, so the, the aim of this is to, to ensure compliance from, from perspective of, of taxpayers and to make sure that um, uh, transfer pricing issues are uh, dealt with um, timely and that they are also dealt, dealt with uh, consistently between the countries. Um, and uh, the, the reporting uh, requirement is, is basically consistent between the countries, which on the other side um, 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 reduces, so, so to say, um, uh, the, the, the burden of, 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 of the group and um, facilitates by, by uh, letting it uh, and, and having the same requirement in, in all the countries. Um, now we are going to hear uh, a bit about how, what are the documentation requirements in Russia. Thanks, Anna. Uh, currently, Russia only partly implemented new BEPS style three tier transfer pricing documentation requirements. On the one hand, Russia joined multilateral international convention on automatic CBCR exchange, but on the other hand, local legislation is still in draft form. The third, and we hope the final version of the uh, of the draft law was published only recently, and now the legislation largely in line with OECD model, model legislation. First reporting period for CBCR is 2017, and uh, it is uh, possible to report for 2016 voluntarily. Uh, turnover threshold is 50 billion rubles, uh, and uh, it is uh, currently it is slightly higher than uh, 750 million euros, uh, but if we calculate it based on average rate for 2016, and you can see on the slide, it would be slightly lower. Uh, if you have uh, several legal entities in Russia, you can choose the reporting entity and provide uh, notification on the participation in a multinational group. Uh, this entity will provide notification for all the Russian entities. Uh, Non-compliance penalty are insignificant uh, and uh, main compliance dates you can see on the next slide. So uh, local file may be requested not earlier than 1st of June 2018 for, for the groups uh, for which uh, financial year is equal to calendar year, which is most of the Russian-based group, but not, not necessarily German. Uh, 
Uh, notification on participation in multinational enterprise should be submitted uh, till 31st of July, uh, meaning eight months since, since the end of the, uh, the fiscal year, and uh, the CBC report should be submitted by the end of the 2018. Uh, master file may be requested not earlier than uh, 15 months after the end of, uh, uh, of the financial year. Uh, and for for uh, for the group uh, where financial year is equal to calendar year, it would be 31st of March. Uh, master file uh, for Russian-based multinationals should be in Russian language. For foreign-based multinational, uh, it, it is possible to provide master file in in a local language. Handing back to my German colleagues. Thank you, Alexei. Um, so um, next, uh, we will go um, briefly through um, the documentation requirements in Germany and basically how best recommendations were implemented in, in Germany. Um, so we have um, the, the three-tier three approach uh, which is uh, implemented. Um, country by country reporting requirement is applicable as of uh, 2016. Um, it is uh, applicable for uh, multinational groups with consolidated revenue over uh, 750 million. Um, uh, due date for preparation is uh, 12 uh, months after the end of fi financial years, which is uh, also the, the deadline for submission. Um, penalty for uh, delayed or uh, incomplete submission is up to 10,000 um, euro. Um, the secondary, uh, secondary mechanism is, is uh, applicable as of uh, 2017, and um, Germany is the um, signatory of the multilateral, multilateral agreement on automatic exchange. Also, master and local file uh, rule apply. Um, this, um, uh, this requirement, master file requirement, applies for applies for group with revenue higher um, than 100 million euro. Uh, but the application of, of this requirement is uh, a bit delayed compared to the country by country reporting, and this requirement is applicable only as as of 2017, uh, and before 2017, so for 2016, only the, the standard uh, um, documentation requirement that was already applicable in the German law previously applies. Um, with regard to preparation and uh, submission deadlines, um, this still remains pretty much the same as it was um, in, in the previous uh, uh, um, version of the law and the, in, the, in the, let's say, old requirements, uh, which is that uh, the due date for preparation and submission um, depends on whether this is um, um, uh, extraordinary uh, business transaction or regular business transaction. So for regular business transaction, we just have the requirement that the documentation must be submitted within 30 days, um, uh, within 60 days upon request from the from the um, tax, uh, tax authorities, and um, it can also then this is also a deadline for for preparation. While for extraordinary business transaction, we have the requirement that the documentation must be prepared within six months after the end of the financial year uh, in which the, the, the transaction took place, and the documentation must be provided uh, by the, to the tax authorities um, within 30 days from, from their request. Um, now, what is um, specific uh, with regard to, to how um, BEPS requirements are, are implemented in Germany? So, so basically, uh, the, the German documentation requirements are in line with, uh, with, with BEPS uh, approach. Um, however, there are some, some specifics. Um, uh, these are um, listed on, on the slide that you can see now. And um, the main, let's say, specific requirements in the German uh, legislation are related to 
um, uh, special accent, let's say, on the, on the price setting uh, process and providing the information that was available um, to the taxpayer at the, at the time when the price was um, determined. So, so this is uh, something that is uh, that, that should be then very um, uh, that is very significant for the for the taxpayers in Germany. So it is not uh, possible just to to um, document the, the transaction only at the end and document the the end result. But it is, it is uh, necessary to think about it at the time when when the price for the transaction uh, is being set. Um, also, um, it is, there is a requirement that the, the tax auditor must be provided um, access to the databases that were used for the benchmarking analysis and in the version that was used by the taxpayer or their consultant. So, um, not just to, to um, have access to the database, but um, to have access to the version of the database that was applicable, for example, two years ago when you were doing this, this benchmarking study and when you were um, setting the price or, or doing the analysis at, at this moment. This is also something that, that will require some um, technical <laughs> consideration, what is the best way to, um, uh, to do it and what is the best way to provide this um, uh, to the tax authorities, but it could uh, represent, um, let's say, additional burden for, for the taxpayers. Um, additional requirements are also a requirement to name of the person who was actually uh, in charge for making the decision regarding, to the, uh, regarding the intercompany transaction in question. Um, and also um, very significant the requirement to support the weighting of allocation factor with quantitative data when applying um, the, the profit. Uh, profit split uh, method. Um, one, one additional requirement um, that, that, um, that is also um, significant from, from at least technical perspective uh, when, when dealing with the tax authorities is also that um, the documentation must be submitted in German language and only on request in, in special uh, circumstances upon uh, uh, approval from the tax authorities, the documentation uh, may be submitted um, in, in English. Uh, that was um, briefly about the um, documentation requirements. Now we go to the next topic, which is um, very relevant um, when, when talking uh, about um, uh, Russia, especially um, with regard to, to uh, a related party transaction involving sale of, sale of goods, and this is um, year-end adjustment and, and customs. Um, so let's go back to our Russian colleagues and see how this works. Oh, sorry. First, uh, we, we we will cover this from from German perspective. So, Stephanie, yeah, I, I, I first make a brief introduction what um, uh, um, year-end adjustments uh, can um, be and how they can look like. So you can do that for uh, future periods on a quarterly basis. That is very intensive. Uh, um, takes a lot of uh, maintenance and uh, good tools in in your enterprises. And you can also make them retroactively um, at the year end, really then back to the very end, to the very beginning um, of the year and adjust it all in one um, payment. Um, as Anna already um, uh, elaborated on our documentation, a very specific documentation requirements here in Germany to document the price setting approach. That would be such a topic. Yeah, year end adjustments needs to be um, needs to be um, described in the price setting approach how they should be um, applied at the end of the year or each quarter or half yearly or whatsoever. But that is really a topic for the price setting approach to make sure at the very beginning um, how you want to set your prices during the financial and fiscal year. But before we come to details in Germany, I hand over now to my Russian colleagues and they give us an overview 
what um, year-end adjustment means in Russia, especially in combination with customs. Stephanie, thank you very much. Uh, Year-end adjustment for Russian TP purposes is a complex issue. All the approaches described by, by Stephanie should be carefully implemented, taking into account three main complicating factors. Uh, first and foremost, uh, downward, uh, downward adjustments are forbidden by local TP legislation, which means if profitability of your Russian distribution entity is too high, you are not allowed to make TP adjustment and bring it to, to the arm's length level. Upward adjustments could be done, but if Russian entity just increase its taxable base, it will help, of course, to avoid TP issues like, uh, like adjustments and penalties, but on the other hand, it results in double taxation. To avoid double taxation, some companies provide bonuses, which doesn't change price of goods. Uh, and in some cases uh, provide discounts, which of course change the price of important goods. And here we will face the second obstacle, which is customs legislation. If your transfer pricing planning policy requires changes of imported products prices, you have to consider customs legislation very carefully. Uh, uh, when the tax department of the company implemented ATP strategy, which creates significant customs issues, uh, are quite common among our clients. And we even created a subgroup in the transfer pricing group in Moscow office, which helped uh, to develop a pricing strategy which is compliant both with transfer pricing and customs legislation. It is, of course, not an easy task, as the tax and customs authorities have a contradictory goals. For example, for import transactions, customs authorities often try to increase prices of imported goods, as it means higher customs duties, whereas uh, tax authorities almost always try to argue that the prices is too high and decrease it, uh, as it means lower costs for, for Russian entity and higher taxable profits. In our work, we are trying to apply positive legislative trend in this area, which help us to narrow the gap between customs and TP legislation. Uh, such trends include uh, possibility to implement price review clause into intercompany agreements, providing TP documentation to customs authorities as an evidence that the relationship between penalties uh, between parties does not influence prices. And uh, fortunately, in March, the first court case was published where TP documentation was mentioned as one of the acceptable evidence in pure custom case, customs case. Uh, the second, uh, the third, and uh, probably the last obstacle which should be also considered is currency control legislation. Uh, in practice, we have seen cases when even upward adjustment payments transferred by foreign company to Russian subsidiary were rejected by Russian banks on the ground that such pay payments are not in line with currency control legislation. All these obstacles I mentioned uh, are manageable, uh, but uh, definitely should be taken into account. Handing over back to Anna or Stephanie to, to describe the peculiarities of German legislation. Thank you, Alexi. So I would share with you one particular issue we are facing here regularly um, with your end adjustments and um, with formal requirements in Germany. So for that you have to understand that our national law always has to be applied first. So before it comes to any foreign tax act, tax auditors have to make their first um, decision on national law, corporate income tax law. And there we have a construct which is um, uh, called the hidden profit distribution. Hidden profit distribution can be avoided by some formal um, aspects. So formal would be to have 
pre-agreed written agreements in place where it's explicitly lined out how and um, when a year-end adjustment should be made. So I come back to what I said at the beginning of this chapter. Um, when it comes to a price setting documentation, please make sure you have a contract and pre-agreed written contract in place before you apply um, the pricing mechanism, especially when it has a year-end adjustment clause. Um, so based on this um, agreement, yeah, you should make your contractual party aware of that the price being set um, during the year might be not the final price, but the final price will have been um, deducted when at year end it's shown that you um, um, got a special margin, a target margin, or um, you were out of the range and you have to adjust then the prices to be in the arm's length range means to the upper or lower quartile, or you eventually even target one specific margin, one specific point of your in, in arm's length range. So um, we had here a court case in 2012 where that was of discussion. So is it really necessary to have this formal aspect also in an international um, context and um, is it not more over the way that our international law, like double tax treaties, are saying um, whatever locally is required from a formal perspective, at the end of the day, all what count is that we have an arm's length price. And that was this court decision mentioned here, what you have now in front of you, that was saying, no, um, Article 9, Paragraph 2 of our double tax treaty, model tax treaty, is saying, um, or is giving you a blocking effect on your national law, national formal requirement. But now be careful. In the German-Russian double tax treaty, we don't have um, paragraph 2 of, in Article 9. So please be aware of that this might help you in other tax audits, but not in relation with Russia, as there is no paragraph 2 mentioned in the Double Tax Treaty. And to make it round, um, when you have um, double checked national law or more over the tax auditors doing that for you, and um, he cannot make any adjustment on national law or moreover the adjustment on international law would be even higher, then he can go for foreign tax act, and then the formal um, requirements um, would be would be different from from the national ones. So um, let's see how um, this is applied or handled uh, in, in Russia in tax audit um, procedures. And um, so I would ask our Russian colleagues, please share your tax audit um, experiences with us uh, now. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, TP audit procedures in Russia, transfer pricing procedures, I mean, is quite specific. The first of all, TP audit is neither field or no, no desk audit. It is a different tax control procedure. Timeline is different. TP audit could last for more than two years. Tax authority has a different rights. But most importantly, uh, that only specific TP department has an authority uh, to initiate and conduct TP audit. Local tax authorities don't have, uh, don't have right to check arm's length nature of prices in control transactions, which means only highly specialized officials are dealing with TP, TP issues in Russia. Currently, a couple of dozen TP audits are in the process. 2012-2014 transactions are currently audited. Main focus of Russian tax authorities uh, in the transaction with commodities, and tax authorities are trying to apply comparable uncontrolled price method as much as possible. We supported several clients and could say that unlike in regular tax audits, uh, tax authorities are quite open. They are ready to discuss the controversial issues with the taxpayers and ready to hear the position of a taxpayer, and in some cases even agree with the taxpayers' arguments. As a result, uh, in our cases we were able to decrease initial tax adjustments quite significantly. As we understand, almost all uh, other taxpayers also reach an agreement with tax authorities. Uh, uh, 
and uh, as a result, uh, the cases did not go to courts, uh, which is quite quite usual practice for for regular tax audits. As for, for TP court practice, we currently have only one case. The case is quite interesting and potentially quite dangerous for Russian taxpayers. In this case, tax authorities argued that the price of crude oil sold by small Russian oil producer to the independent trading company was too low. Uh, this is a specific of Russian legislation that cross-border transaction with unrelated party could be also controlled. Uh, and there are two cases when uh, such transactions could be controlled by the Russian tax authorities. First, if the subject of the transaction certain type of commodity, or, uh, or uh, in the second case, if uh, a counterparty is located in a low task jurisdiction, tax jurisdiction. In our case, both condition, conditions were met, and tax authorities easily won this case. Uh, not even trying to prove that Russian company and Hong Kong trading company had an intention to use not, uh, not an arms length prices. We believe that the main outcomes uh, of this case are the following. First, transactions with unrelated party could be subject to this TP control not only theoretically, as we, as we thought before, uh, and in, in exceptional cases, but in practice too. Uh, second, uh, small or medium-sized companies could also be audited. TP is a risk issue not only for large multinationals. And the third, uh, quite obvious, it is better to, to be well prepared. In our case, taxpayer does not even submit TP documentation, and this fact plays a significant role in, role in overall outcome of the court case. This is what, what I wanted to say about Russian specific of transfer pricing audits. Handing over back to my German colleagues. Thanks, Alexei. So um, we are coming now to the end of our session. I briefly want to uh, make you aware about the hot topics we are facing here in Germany uh, in terms of um, um, tax audits. So as you can see, trademark license fees, royalties, all this is becoming uh, very, very um, uh, yeah, high, um, uh, highly stressed and highly discussed in, um, I would say, more or less each tax audit I ever saw and where royalty or license fees paid or received. So, and all the, also the year-end adjustments you can see, they are increasing and they are heavily discussed and stressed um, in uh, tax audits. When we come to the setup here, how tax audits are conducted in Germany, we have to um, elaborate a bit on our political situation. So we have here um, a state government as well as a federal government, and as such we have also two types of tax audits, or two um, levels of tax audits. And um, so both on the federal and the state level, there are specialized transfer pricing auditors supporting the field auditors. And large enterprises and group um, tax audits are a follow-up nature. It means these types of taxpayers are audited continuously. And most often, um, the, the tax audit is being carried out for both corporation and trade tax and um, many, many times in combination with VIT, but it could be also handled separately, especially VIT and also wage tax from time to time it's handled separately. But um, when you have to handle yourself on tax audit, um, please make sure that on the tax audit announcement, which gives you the, the scope of the tax audit, all the relevant um, tax fields are really named. We see very often that um, for the sake of transfer pricing, tax auditors are asking for org charts and legal charts. In the end, um, we, we hear during the discussions that they were not for transfer pricing audit, but it was moreover to audit transfer property tax. And um, that 
needs to be uh, yeah, monitored in a way that they don't use your um, TP document for transfer property tax or any other issues which have not been named and lined out in your announcement, in the tax audit announcement. So for sure for them it's easy to extend this tax audit announcement and extend the scope of the audit, but um, it cannot be the way that they come up with a finding for transfer property tax when your tax audit is just for the scope of income, corporation tax, and trade tax. So please have an eye on this. When it comes to fines that you have no documentation in place or you are delayed with documentation, we have to say that we don't see fines that quite often. You really have to be reluctant on transfer pricing on your requirements, documentation requirements to fulfill them that German authorities really want to apply um, um, fines. We see it more in the north of Germany and less in the south of Germany. That's also coming here from the political situation situation of the um, 16 national states, um, that the northern one might be a bit more strict than the southern one. Um, but all in all, when you show your um, serious um, um, intention to come up with some sort of a TP documentation, then they would not um, yeah, charge you a fine, but would handle it and do the very best with it. And it's always the way that even during a tax audit you can improve your documentation. So when there is missing something, when there's something not um, explained in detail and they ask for more, that gives no reason for fines. You simply have to come up then with additional information in time. And um, that is uh, yeah, very often the case, so that's not really, um, um, really rarely to, to see. So we are now at the end of our webcast, and we have here a couple of questions. There are really um, um, a lot. Let's see what we want to answer first. Um, Alexi and Julia, I guess most of the questions are really um, from, from a Russian perspective. Um, do you want to start to answer them? Yeah, we can answer one of the uh, questions that were raised, uh, and this is the question regarding the requirements to the local economic analysis for the Russian transfer pricing purposes. Uh, we should mention that uh, under Russian tax law, it is required to have Russian comparable companies in place, and the Russian tax code allows to use foreign comparable companies only if the taxpayer demonstrates that uh, he uh, did all the efforts to identify Russian comparable companies, and if he failed, we can switch to foreign comparables. But uh, based on our discussion with the Russian tax authorities, they would expect that uh, to see uh, Russian comparables, and it is only an exceptional case when they can um, consider uh, using foreign comparable companies. So I think that is. That is it from the Russian transfer pricing perspective. I don't know whether we can hear Alexei. Maybe he will also try to answer any question. We have actually quite a number of questions, quite interesting, but unfortunately our time is over and we are two minutes late. So we will definitely answer all the questions, uh, but uh, individually by, by email. Okay. So um, we come to the end and we want to thank you for participating in our webcast. Um, as, as Alex said, we will for sure answer your question, but then on an individual basis. Um, it was a pleasure to have here the webcast with you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. We wish you a uh, nice remaining week. Take care and bye-bye.